Matthew 13, verses 44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. Everybody say treasure. treasure. Which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. Everybody say fine pearls. I gotta have soul with that. Come on, let me hear it again. Fine pearls. Fine. Yeah, like like you know, like Will Smith would do on Fresh Prince. Girl, you fine. Like something like that. You know, fine pearls. Um, search of fine pearls. Who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought. Today, I want to preach to you from the subject treasure and pearls. Treasure and pearls. You know. I brought with me some treasure pearls just to show you guys how, how wealthy I am. I'm just playing. But treasure is a beautiful thing. And so are pearls. There's treasure and then there's pearls. See, treasure is something that we value. You know, there's a monetary value of treasure. Way back since, way back in the day, people have been in search and always seeking and trying to get more and more treasure or or things of that carry value like treasure and gold and silver and even today people are are have weird things and ideas about gold and, and, and currency and all this stuff treasure you know it goes back to the Johnny Depp days of pirates in the Caribbean you know pirates and are searching for the lost treasure treasure you know I wish this was real but it's not but that's okay because I have a different treasure and his name is Jesus. Amen. Who's, how many people's treasure is Jesus here today? Amen. And then you have pearls like these here. Now, these also are not real, so don't judge me for not me bringing real pearls. However, pearls, see, pearls have a little bit of a different effect on our hearts than treasure. Treasure's like, ooh, my precious, give me power, my success. Pearls are like, wow, beautiful, majestic in nature. We're going to learn today about treasures and pearls. And Jesus is sharing another set of parables in his series of seven parables that he taught while he was on the boat and all the masses of people were out on the shore listening to this man, Jesus, proclaim what the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, if you're joining us for the first time in person or online, We've begun a series called Secrets a few weeks back where we're looking at these parables that Jesus taught and he said that these are secrets. Remember when he told his disciples after they came to him, after he spoke and taught the first parable, they came and said, Master, Master, what is the meaning behind these parables, this parable you spoke? And he tells them, to you has been given to know the secrets, everybody say secrets, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven but to them it has not been given to know to them to the masses to the majority of people the secrets of God's kingdom are closed up they will not know them and they will not discover the truth that is hidden within these parables and so we've looked at I believe four or maybe five of them and we're coming on these two now and Jesus talked about the sower who went out to sow, remember that? And he sowed seed on different types of soil, and that represented different kinds of heart. And then we talked about the parable of the wheat and the tares, and how the, the wheat or the weeds were, were at false believers, people who may look look like a real disciple, but in all reality, they're really not the weeds, and they creep up together alongside the wheat. And then you keep going through the rest, and Jesus was continuing to lay out parables and disclose or reveal top secret truth only to his disciples. These parables were not just true stories. They actually in, had truth embedded in them that was necessary and that is necessary for you and I to know in order to walk in a right manner before God and in order to walk with wisdom, understanding in the age in which we live. See, the parables Jesus threw out and cast out so that we could be prepared for the current age, the age between his comings. See, he came that one time, and then he left. And he left us with these parables so that we could know what to look for. So that we could know what to expect in life on earth before he comes again. 
And so he would say the kingdom of heaven is like, and he was comparing the kingdom to these stories. Now, I know many Christians talk the kingdom, and they talk about the kingdom and kingdom everything. Kingdom this, kingdom that. But do we really know what the kingdom represents or what it means? The kingdom of God is his rulership on earth, from heaven on earth. God's kingdom is governing the affairs of human history. God's kingdom. He is behind human events. He is behind the things that take place in human life. And so he's, Jesus is saying, life on earth will be like this. Will be something like a sower who went out to sow. And da, 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 da. So let's break down these parables and let's see what Jesus is talking about and find the meaning in them because I think it's very important. These two I really enjoy studying and preparing for and I think you guys will find great uh, awe in God and his wisdom and how he carried out what these represent. The kingdom of heaven, he says, is like a treasure hidden in a field. Immediately, what do we see? We see two things that repeated from the last couple of parables. The field and a man. The field and a man. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who went. So who is the man? Remember, Jesus already gave us the answer. We don't have, we're not left to ourselves to interpret who the man is. He is the man. He is the man who sowed the seed. He is the man who planted the mustard, the mustard seed. He's the man. So now Jesus here has hidden a treasure in a field. What is the field? Remember, he told us what the field is too. And he said, the field is the world, humanity. The field is not just the church. The field is not just the kingdom. The field represents humanity. So here we have Jesus planting, or excuse me, finding a treasure in the world of humanity. It says, which a man found, and then he covered up. Well, that's interesting. So, treasure, oh look, it was hidden, now he finds it, oh, look at that, treasure. And then he's like, wow, treasure is not my precious, and I take care of it, because we take care of things that we treasure. But then it said he covered it up again. What the heck? Who in their right mind is going to find treasure and then go bury it again? Not me, I guess maybe some people do that, but I wouldn't be doing that, and I think generally most people don't aren't going to do that. And then it says, and then he goes in his joy, and he sells all that he has, and he buys the field. Doesn't just buy the treasure, but the field. Now, what is he saying in here? Let's go ahead and defunct the popular interpretation of this parable. It's very cutesy, it's very Christian, and it's very, woohoo, go us, you know? Most people interpret this parable as meaning, we are the man, we are the person who finds the treasure, and the treasure is the gospel, or the treasure is Jesus. And then when upon finding the treasure of the gospel, which it is a treasure, and Jesus is a treasure, we go sell all that we have, and we go and buy the field. See, that doesn't even make sense. If you break that down, and that, that parable, if that, mean, that interpretation does not really make sense if you put it all together. First of all, you cannot purchase the gospel. You cannot buy your salvation. So how can, if that interpretation is right, you go and sell all you have. You sell your all you have and buy that field? Well, what are you buying and why are you buying, buying the field? See, Jesus already said the field is the world. So you see how this doesn't line up? And it sounds cute and it's and, and in theory there are some truths to it. Yeah, we give up all we have and sacrifice and surrender to Jesus. That is true, but that's not what this parable is talking about. So let's discover, let's first look at the treasure. The treasure hidden in the field. If the field is humanity and the world, the Old Testament, I love how God puts together the Old and the New Testament. It's a beautiful thing because they're connected. If you go to the book of Exodus, which you don't have to, I'm just going to read it for you. If you'd like to, you can. In verse 19, or chapter 19, verse 5, listen to what God says. He says, now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And then again, in the book of Psalm, chapter 135, verse 4, he says, for the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel, for his special treasure. We don't have to interpret it. The word of God interprets itself. The treasure here is the nation Israel. God's initial chosen people. If you look at the account of the Old Testament, you find 
that the nation Israel did not begin as a great and mighty powerful nation. The nation Israel was a nobody, kind of like you and I. But God found them in the world of humanity. He found one man by the name of Abraham, and he chose Abraham to be the father of a nation, and that nation would become Israel. Jacob, his name was changed from Jacob to Israel, and it went from Abraham to Abraham, and, his, and Isaac, and Abraham and Isaac, and then Isaac had Jacob, and, he, and then the nation continued to grow from one to a mass nation, and that nation was God's treasure. He was, they were his precious. And you see, I need to ask you this question because I don't know if you know it. Why did God choose Israel? Why are they his chosen people? And how in the heck, if, if they're his chosen people, how did we, non-Jewish people, get included into this big grand plan of God's redemption? Well, you see, God chose them as his treasured, special, prized possession to be a sample, to be a demonstration to the rest of the world of what a right relationship with God ought to look like. He chose them to display to the world the peace the power, the authority that is available to those who walk humbly before God in obedience and faith. They were a, an exhibit for all the world and all the pagan and godless nations to see who God is and to discover the grace of God that is available. That's why he chose Israel. That's why they were his chosen people. And they were his treasure. So in other words... God's dealings in his relationship and interaction with the nation Israel was in order for us to see, in order for the world to see how we can walk in a relationship with him based on faith, obedience, grace, mercy, forgiveness, and influence. And they were to influence the world. But if you discover in the Old Testament anything about this nation, you find they were kind of a rascal little nation. This nation Israel, man, they were hard-headed. They were stubborn. Kind of like some of you guys here right now. You know, things went in one ear and out the other. The nation of Israel didn't fulfill that calling. They failed in fulfilling the calling that God had for them. And yes, there were glimpses and moments of time where they did show the world and they did walk in right, right relationship to God and, so, and thus showed the world who God was and His grace. But most of the time, they didn't. And as long as they were walking in obedience, the world could see. A prime example of that is King Solomon. His kingdom, you know, in his during his reign as king of Israel, the nation experienced the most peace they ever experienced. They experienced the most peace they ever experienced. Why? Because Solomon obeyed God and he lived by faith and he trusted everything that God said. Not everything. He had flaws, of course. We know that. The Bible is a real, is an is account of real life. So it's not saying that he was perfect as in he was sinless. But Solomon did what was right in the eyes of God for at least part of his time as king. And the nation experienced great peace also during King David's time. Great peace. Remember the queen who came to visit Solomon because she had heard of his wisdom? And she came as a pagan queen of a godless nation. She came and she said, I want to know more about about this wisdom that you had and about this God that you're serving. Israel was his treasure and he was chosen and so they were chosen and selected to show the world. Now, as soon as the nation though would walk in disobedience, as soon as they would turn away from God and forsake him, you find that that treasures in a way was covered up like the world couldn't see anymore that witness. Their witness had been lost. They were still the children of God, but their witness, their power, and their influence, gone. I wonder if that's if any of us have ever experienced that in our own lives. So you know, because God has also chosen you and I, because we know that he did not intend salvation to only be for the Israelite, the Jewish people. The word of God tells us that the Gentile people, the non-Jews, have been brought into the covenant of God in the new covenant. And so it's Jew and Gentile alike. But the question that I asked was, I wonder if any of us have experienced that. 
where we're walking in obedience and faith and we experience the peace that comes from that. But the moment that we turn away or we begin walking in partial obedience or we begin forsaking or forgetting God, we lose our power. We lose our effectiveness. We lose our fervor for God and we lose our influence. And we no longer have the ability to testify of God in a powerful and ineffective way. That's what happened when the nation would walk in disobedience. And so at the close of the Old Testament, the treasure was covered up. God stopped speaking for 400 years. There was nothing from God in the nation. Because if you remember the sermon I preached a few weeks back called Use It or Lose It, they did not use the promises. They did not use the revelation that God had given them. They did. They sat on it. They did nothing with it. And therefore God removed it from them. He removed their ability to carry out and fulfill their calling. And so they were covered up again. However, at the beginning of the New Testament, at the start of the New Testament, onto the scenes steps Jesus Christ, born of a woman, born to Mary and Joseph. And then what happened? Do you remember as a young baby, where did Mary and Joseph go? To hide. Egypt. Do you remember the nation Israel? Where did God call them out of? Egypt. God says, out of Egypt I have called my son. In one of the Old Testament prophets. And he's referring to Israel as his son. Matthew says, out of Egypt I have called my son. He's referring to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the true embodiment of Israel. So Jesus came as a Jew to be the full picture and the full manifestation of what the people of God were supposed to be, of the power that the people of God were supposed to walk in, of the authority that the people of God were supposed to have. Jesus came, God said, I tried with my people, they didn't fulfill it, so I'm going to step into earth and I'm going to display to the world for three years the peace that is available, the grace that is available, the power, the joy, the happiness, the freedom that is available to those who walk humbly before me. Jesus showed the world for three years what Israel was supposed to show the world. Jesus is God's treasure. Treasures him highly above all else. And Jesus showed us the looking world, the Gentile world, and the Jews because they have failed to do what they were called to do. He showed us for a glimpse of history. That treasure was uncovered again for three years. That treasure was uncovered and Jesus showed us. He walked on water. He turned water into wine. He healed lepers. He raised the dead. And he did not let a religious spirit come over him. He said no to every temptation that came his way. And he said, devil, get behind me. He said, devil, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God. And him alone shall you serve. How many people in here want to have the power of Jesus in their life? Want to experience the authority of Jesus? See, Jesus came, yes, as an example. You know how people always say Jesus came and he was a good teacher, da, 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 da. but that's about it. Yes, sure, he was a good teacher, and yes, he did come as an example, but he came as an example to display to us that if we obey the Father and walk before him by faith, then we too can do what he's done, and he's actually made a promise that greater things than these will my people do if they choose to walk in obedience to me. See, you are one step away from walking in to the powerful, effective resurrection power of Jesus Christ. It's one step of obedience. It's one step of faith. Jesus said what? I do only what I see my Father doing. I don't do what the culture is doing. I wonder how many of us are following the culture more than we follow Jesus. Jesus said, I do only what I hear the Father tell me. That tells me that we can hear from God and he does speak. But the answer is, are we listening? And the answer is, if we're listening, are we going to do that? Jesus came and God uncovered the treasure again. But then at the end of his three-year ministry, darkness set in. 
appeared as all hope was lost. Because on a very memorable day in history, the Son of Man was lifted up, was put onto a cross, was hung in humiliation and shame, mockery by the hands of his own people who came to save him. Rejected, despised, scorned, broken. And on that day, as he was crucified, that treasure went hidden again. And his disciples wondered and thought we had hoped he was the one to come. But maybe he really wasn't. We, 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 we left everything and followed him. And now look, he's hanging on a tree. Remember the mocking? Come down from there. If you are the Son of God, you're the Son of God, spring yourself down from that cross. And he stayed there. But you see, he stayed there because his staying there would purchase you and me and the Jewish people and the black people and the white people and the Hispanics and the little and the big and the skinny and the fat because it said in all of his joy, he went and he sold all he had. He sacrificed, he gave up everything that he was. He gave up his throne in heaven and he bought not just the, the treasure, but the world. He bought the field because what does that mean? In that world, in that field is the treasure. So he purchased his people who rejected him, the nation Israel. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. But he also purchased some pearls that he went to find. Verse 46, 45 and 46, when he says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all he had and bought it. This parable is not the same parable as the one that I just read. Most people interpret it the same way. It's just the same thing, meaning with a different analogy. The pearls, the pearl is the gospel, and we're Jesus, and we go and find the gospel, and we give everything we have. So that's not. See, the pearls, the pearls represent and picture you and I. And I wonder if you know why this pictures the Gentile nations, the church that was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. So you see, this says, a man, this merchant, went in search of fine pearls. He went in search of fine pearls. Where were you when God found you? I know that you weren't looking for him. Raise a hand. Let me hear, let me see a hand that says, I was searching for God when I got saved. He's a merchant in search of fine pearls, and he finds you. And how does he find you? When he finds you, he finds you like a pearl was before it became a pearl. What was a pearl before it was a pearl? A pearl before it was a pearl was an oyster. You know, Rocky Mountain oysters. I don't like those. My, my dad always tried to take my mom out before she knew what those were and have her eat them. She's like, what is it? I don't mess with no Rocky Mountain oysters. I don't know where the Rocky Mountains. But anyway. That's not what the sermon is about. <laughs> Fine pearls. Oysters don't begin as pearls. My friends, what is the work that Jesus Christ is doing in the work in the life of you and I? You see, we, we were Gentiles. You know, we weren't a part of the promises. Originally, we weren't a part of that old covenant. All the promises, if you read the book, Romans 9, 10, and 11, what you find is that God, the covenants belong to Israel. The promises belong to, to Israel. The patriarchs belong to Israel. The Messiah belonged to Israel. So how did we get involved in all this? Where did we come in? See, we need to have a humble reverence and a respect for Israel because they were a part. They were the original chosen ones. I wasn't originally chosen. See, it says I was without hope without God in the world. Read the book of Ephesians. But God. Everybody say, but God. But God. Say, but God. 
who is rich in mercy, he came and found us. He saw that his people, his original treasures, weren't doing anything and they weren't walking as he wanted them to walk. So it says that he set them aside for a time. He laid them aside. He put them on pause. He said, okay, if you're not going to do anything with my grace, if you're not going to do anything with my mercy, let me go find the people who will. Let me go find the people who aren't looking for me. You weren't looking for God when he found you. We were lost and dead in our trespasses and sin, but God, who is rich in mercy, found us. He found you dead, broke, just like an old oyster. Ugly, you ain't worth much, you, you ain't much impressive, just like an oyster, and you know what he did? He transformed you into a beautiful, majestic pearl. Do you know your identity today? Because you are not who you once were. You are now a pearl who Christ found, and you have great value, and you have great worth, woman of God. You need to not give yourself away because the God of the universe has found you. Don't give yourself away to people. You need to know your worth. Man of God, do you know your worth is not wrapped up in your accomplishments, in your money, in your bank account, in the car you drive, in the looks that you have, in your, in your good good looking body, you know, I look at me, I am sexy up here, but see that's not what my worth is found, my worth is found in Jesus Christ, can we put our hands together right now, for Jesus, where is your worth found, do you know who you are, so Jesus, so God, in his wisdom, you know what kind of wisdom it takes for God to do what he did, and how he included the entire world in his plan of redemption, are you kidding me? He originally gave it to Israel, his first child, his eldest born, you know, Israel, excuse me, but they didn't want it. And so, like any good parent would do, if you give a toy to one kid and they don't use it or they trample all over it, you take it back and you give it to the other one. And guess what happens when you give it to the other one? That one gets jealous, doesn't it? Hey, wait a minute, that's my toy. I want that. That's what God did with Israel and us. See, we weren't a part. It was Israel. He gave it to them. Salvation is yours. Believe me, trust me. I'll lead you into a promised land. I'll set you free. I'll deliver you. I'll give you influence in the world. They didn't want it. I said, okay, turn to the Gentiles, to people who were not my people. So those who are not my people, I will call my people. I will make a, a great nation out of them, or I will make a great people out of them, and they will be called my church. My church, the ecclesia, the called out. That's what church means. This is not church. You are church. You are church. Nikolai, you are church. We are church. The called out. That's what church is. And he said, I'll call out a people who are over there lost as all get out, wandering around. Just <laughs> like, like the look Carson got on the fact, you know, just kind of just like Carson. Love it. But that's what the church is. And he called us each out. And he transformed us. And how did he transform us? The same way that an oyster is transformed into a pearl. You know how? A grain of sand, a rock, something that irritates, gets into the, to the shell, gets into the oyster. And it irritates and it causes some pain and it ruffles some feathers. And all of a sudden, uh-oh, that grain of sand that originally pricked caused some irritation. It begins to cause a transformation. That which initially caused irritation caused transformation. The gospel comes and it penetrates the individual and it's a little bit irritating. It pricks the heart because it confronts your sin, it confronts your evil, it confronts your flaws, it confronts your past, it confronts your unrighteousness. But when you embrace it and you say, wait, 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 I'm not going to be prideful and I'll close myself off and say, no, 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 God, I am righteous, I am good, Dude, I don't need no gospel, I don't need Jesus, da, 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 da. But when you humble yourself and you say, wait a minute, the truth, this is true, he's confronting me. Yes, it's getting in it, and he's touching my, my points of pain. Your points of pain is where the gospel hits and it touches, but that causes transformation where you become a pearl of great value, and now you have value, and in the kingdom of God, God will use you, and now all of a sudden, it's treasure and it's pearls together in one great, big, great family of God, the people of God, Jew and Gentile alike. It says in the book of Ephesians, God has divided or has destroyed the dividing wall of hostility that stood between culture, the Jewish culture, and the rest of the world. No more is that. We there is no more male, female, he says. There is no more Jew, Gentile. There is no more slave, free. There is no more black, white. There is no more this, that. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen. Make some noise for that. Come on, people. This is the gospel. This is what you claim to follow. This is, what, this is the God you claim to worship. You have to know the glory of how he brought you in. He laid them aside and he brought in the Gentiles. 
us who didn't belong, who were nobodies, from nothing to something is the story of all of God's people. Anybody ever see that 50 Cent movie, From Nothing to Something? Joey, I bet you did. Maybe you didn't. Anyway, you know, that's a, that's a big hip-hop thing in, in the hip-hop culture. Is, you know, I, I came from nothing, and now look at me. But they're boasting themselves. See, as believers, we came from nothing, but we don't boast in ourselves and say, now look at me. We say, look what God has done. See, I was, I was, I was broke, busted, and disgusted. But Jesus found me. He searched me out. I did not search him out. He searched me out. I'm going to end with this verse from Romans chapter 10. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. Everyone. No distinction. And now, my friends, we are both his treasure. You are treasured by God. Man of God, woman of God, you are treasured. And now we are also his beautiful majestic pearls on display for not only the whole world to see earth and heaven it says we are as the church put on display so that even the heavens even the angelic beings look upon the church of Jesus Christ the body of Christ and they are in awe so that they might know the manifold wisdom of God himself in Jesus' name.